Hello, everyone, and welcome to Church at Home with Rachel Gospel on the Go for Sunday, the 26th of, of May. And today is Trinity Sunday, probably the most powerful um, theological Sunday of the year. And so we will walk together through our morning prayer. If you have an Anglican Book of Alternative Services, we will begin on page 47. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. And our invitatory sentence is, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. O come, let us worship. And together we'll say the Jubilate, which can be found on page 49. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his faithfulness endures from age to age. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. O come, let us worship. We're going to read two passages today. First of all, the first passage will be from Isaiah, chapter, um, the sixth chapter of Isaiah, verses 1 to 6. In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe to me, is me, I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I have lived among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And whom will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our gospel is taken from the third chapter of John, verses 1 to 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, We speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of Christ. 
praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I speak to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before I begin to expound on the, this gospel and the lesson for this high festival of Trinity Sunday, let me just say that it is a doozy to preach on such a theologically charged, doctrine-filled, and dogmatically challenging Sunday of the year. You see, the doctrine and theology of the Trinity is, is one that has had seminarians and preachers worldwide trembling in their pulpits since the time when Augustine wasn't yet known as a saint. So are you all ready for a theological treatise on the true nature of the Trinity as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? If you are, then I will invite Father so-and-so or Mother Cheryl or some other person, some other priest, or some students to, to, to trade places with me. But if you aren't quite up for a theological lecture on the, on, the, on the foundation of our church and our entire spirituality, then stick with me because we're about to wander down an entirely different path, a garden path, one that requires companions along the journey. So I invite you to join me in a not-so-intellectual sermon as I share with you some thoughts about really what really is important about the Trinity, at least important for our day and age, for our community, and for each of us as fellow companions on the path, the Trinity has created and invited us to remember. The first step along the path this morning, first of all, get comfortable. I'm going to, I'm reading from a text, but you know that. I always have a text, mostly. I'm going to read to you from my text. I'm just going to get comfortable here. The first step along our path this morning is to picture yourself in a garden. This garden is the most beautiful garden you have ever seen. It has all of your favorite flowers. It smells heavenly. If you listen carefully, you can hear the chirp of a newborn baby bird, the whisper of a butterfly's wings, the gentle rustle of leaves as they begin to unfurl on the trees. As you breathe in, you can smell that earthy scent that harkens to mind the newly turned soil as the flowers begin to sprout and the insects emerge to begin a new day. There's a bench right there in your favorite spot in the garden. And as you sit down, you realize that you're no longer alone. Your friend, the gardener, the creator, has joined you. He may just sit silently beside you. Maybe he speaks your name gently. But as you appreciate this glorious garden that seems to be made just for you, you know that the gardener has given you a gift, a twofold gift. A gift of companionship and the gift of sharing this glorious garden with others. And while a part of you may be nervous about sharing your companionship or your special place, an even bigger part of you knows that you are ready to share your good fortune, those gifts that have given so much to your life. In the beginning, when God brought into being all of creation as we know it, and as it was in Genesis, God did so not on his own, in a vacuum, but as part of the Trinity. We know from John's Gospel and elsewhere that the Word, Jesus Christ, was with God from before time began. We also know that the Holy Spirit swept through creation as God spoke it into being. Before there was a world, before there was a solar system, or animals, or plants, and even before there were people, there was a relationship, and that was a relationship of the most incredible intimacy and knowledge. There was the holy tri-unity of God as creator, God as redeemer, and God as sustainer. And from that relationship was born humanity and the, the relationship that God has entrusted to our care. We have been commissioned to take care of this creation that God imagined into being. From the beginning, when God invited Adam and Eve, and then our ancestors, and now us, and 
our children and our children's children into a relationship with him. God was sharing with us not because he had to, not because he must, but because his creation, his love was too beautiful, too encouraging, too inviting not to share with the world. Like that garden you envisioned a moment ago, God made the gift of life and love so enticing that we are compelled to share it with others. Even though we may sometimes feel protective of that gentle and glorious space, we know that we must share that beauty and space with others. And the only way to do that is to reach out in relationship with others and invite them in. Now, in your mind's eye, go back to that garden you swear you sat with the Creator. Feel yourself rise to your feet and leave your bench. As you pause to smell your favorite flower, your eye is caught by the climb of a caterpillar up the tall trunk of that old, old tree. He's heading for a scrumptious leaf he will make his meal. As you continue to stroll, the gardener beckons you to him and he introduces you to his son. You immediately notice the easy way they have with each other. The three of you walk slowly on until you come to a table prepared for you right there in the garden, right before you. All of your favorite foods are there. Drinks have been poured. The Sunday best linens have been laid. Obviously, this meal is a feast to be a feast in honor of someone. It is with a sense of awe and overwhelming humility that you realize that the feast laid before you has been prepared in honor of you and your loved ones who have begun to gather as well. As everyone is seated, the son looks to you and asks, will you offer the grace? Maybe you hesitate. Who are you to pray when all of these family members are gathered about you? Who are you to pray the grace when the father and the son are right there with you? And yet somehow you find you do indeed have the words. Where once you would have felt shy or overwhelmed, now you find yourself speaking from your heart. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This prayer, this grace penned by the Apostle Paul, was written to remind the Corinthians that they were not alone. It was written to remind them that the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, was always with them. But it was also written to remind them that they were not alone because they also had each other, their brothers and sisters in Christ. Once the believers came out of that garden that exemplified their new belief in Christ and their new life as Christians, they were reminded of the importance of walking in relationship both with God and with each other, the members of their church. God gave them life and faith as individuals but he gave them relationships with one another to help them maintain that faith and strengthen their resolve to serve God through Jesus Christ. First came their garden in which faith and relationship with God was created. And then came that community which gathers around the Lord's table where mutual encouragement and strengthening are shared by members of an intimate and relational faith community. Just as the Trinity shares an intimate relationship, so too does a group of people who share a faith commitment and who worship together, gathered around the table of the Lord. One last time, I would like you to picture yourself sitting around that laden table at which you have shared food and drink, prayers and laughter, You push back your chair and take one more sip from your glass. But as just as your family members are beginning to rise to the table, 
The gate at the entrance to the garden opens and a hand reaches through, beckoning all of you to come. Maybe you're hesitant. Maybe you're intrigued. You rise with everyone to see who it is that is calling you to come out. The gardener and his son lead the way. They seem obviously delighted and they embrace this newcomer to your gathering as if seeing a long lost friend. This person who has called you out is indescribable. There is something intangible about this newcomer and yet a sense of peace and warmth watches over you. As you look through the gate into the world out there, you see what the newcomer has called you to see. There are people gathered all around. In a way that you cannot understand, you sense that they are lonely, hungry and afraid. Some of them don't even seem to recognize their needs themselves, but somehow, in the presence of the newcomer who is now standing with the gardener and his son, you have a new sense of knowing. You have a new way of feeling compassion, empathy, a desire to reach out to others. And all of a sudden, you just know. These people outside the gate are hungry and thirsty. They need nourishment and community. They need to be welcomed to your table, to your family. And then again, a new thought startles you. These people outside the gate have never been in the garden. They've never touched the petal of a brand new, a brand new flower. They haven't had a chance to smell the scent of a spring breeze. They've never had the privilege of sitting and sharing that perfect spot on the bench with the gardener. And you find yourself walking slowly through the garden gate, kneeling beside the person who sits by the path, gathering the words you need to invite them to join you for a meal, for a drink, even for a stroll in the garden. And Jesus came to them and said, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. We walk the path of life that God has gifted to us, not alone, but with each other, with, this, with our church communities, with our gospel on the go and church at home communities, with family and friends, with the strangers we meet along the way who reach out to help us and to whom we reach out to offer help. But we also walk always in relationship with the Trinity or the tri-unity of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, who were in relationship with one another before creation even began. Jesus has called out to us, commissioned us to recognize and acknowledge the blessing that is the relationship which exists among the Trinity as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But he has also commissioned us to walk with the Trinity beyond our garden and out into the world, that we might invite others to participate with us in this most complex and yet oh so simple relationship of love between us and the Trinity. We can struggle to understand the complexities of the theology of that gift of the relationship of the Trinity, or we can simply relax and walk with the Trinity as God shares with us his creation, as Jesus the Son shares with us salvation and fulfillment at the table, and as the Holy Spirit who leads us out into the world so that we might invite others into a new relationship with the Trinity and with us in the garden that God prepared long before time began. The garden is waiting. The table is prepared. God's people are waiting beyond the gate, waiting for us to invite them to come and sit with us in the garden and at the table. The Trinity has issued us our call. Now it is our turn to respond. Will you bring others into the garden? and invite them to meet the Trinity as we sit at the table together. Or maybe you still need time to sit in the garden with the Creator, time to wonder and appreciate and prepare. 
There is enough time. You are invited to just sit, to gather at the table, and to reach out to those beyond the gate. Whenever you are ready for your Holy Spirit, for your next step, the Trinity is ready to lead and guide you. Just as God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is ready to lead and guide the community of Church at Home and Gospel on the Go, people of the Diocese of Brandon, the communities from which we come, on our own next steps of faith, up from the table and out through the gate. Amen. Now, on this particular Sunday, as we celebrate to the, the Trinity, I'm going to invite you to turn to page 188 as we share in the Nicene Creed together. Let us confess our faith as we say, We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. And for our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead with his kingdom, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father with the Father and the Son. He is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our prayers today are litany number, let's see here. Litany, the litany for the Holy Spirit, which is number 16 on page 123. And I ask you to take some time to pray for those that you're praying for. We pray for Jerry and Kim, for our friend Richard for for all those people who are preparing for confirmations and baptisms for alexis as she prepares for confirmation in two weeks three weeks pray for all the kids who will go to camp this summer pray for all those who need our prayers let us pray to god the holy spirit saying come holy spirit come come holy spirit creator and renew the face of the earth come holy spirit come Come, Holy Spirit, Counselor, and touch our lips that we may proclaim your word. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, power from on high. Make us agents of peace and ministers of wholeness. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, breath of God. Give life to the dry bones of this exiled age and make us a living people holy and free. Come. Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, wisdom and truth. Strengthen us in the risk of faith. Come, Holy Spirit, come. And the collect for this day, for Trinity Sunday. Father, we praise you. Through your word and Holy Spirit, you created all things. You reveal your salvation in all the world by sending to us Jesus the Christ, the word made flesh. Through your Holy Spirit, you give us a share in your life and love. Fill us with the vision of your glory, that we may always serve and praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.
and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you for joining me today on Gospel on the Go. I will be back again tomorrow for Church at Home with Rachel. I'm glad to see you. I hope you have a blessed Trinity Sunday and that all is going well for you. Always know that you are loved and you are prayed for. God bless everybody.